Okay, very good morning to you. Hope you had a great weekend. It is Monday the 22nd of March. I'm going to do the usual look ahead for the week and what's in store. But before I do, if you are watching this on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. I'd really appreciate it. Um, there was a new video I put out at the weekend, which was a recording of the private session that we did for our Amplify Live community over the FMC last week. But you can find it down here on the Amplify Live videos. Uh, good um, kind of talk through from me and one of the senior traders, Tim Duggan, about kind of preparation and then execution around a major news-driven event. So do check that out if you have time. Um, otherwise, look, let's get straight into it and start talking about what's going on this morning. And a lot on weekend press dominated by the kind of vaccine war situation uh, between that of the UK and the EU. But there is some other updates uh, for me to talk to you about, in particular about a variant that's been and some commentary from the former FDA commissioner at the weekend uh, over the New York variant of the virus. Uh, and then things to look out for really this week. Um, we've got quite a few things on the calendar from the various global flash PMI data points to the jobs data, CPI retail sales coming out of the UK. We've also got uh, Powell and Yellen in a joint congr congressional session as well this week. Uh, and then we're looking out for the first real evidence as well following that significant pace comment from ECB's Christine Lagarde and what does that PEP uh, regular update figure, which we'll get later on this afternoon, look like as well from the ECB. So quite a few things in store. Uh, and starting off here with some of the charts and the dollar index is up marginally this morning, up around two tenths of 1%. So it is weighing on the major pairs, I would say, um, to an equal degree, both down 30 pips at the moment this morning, but just keeping an eye on Euro, uh, it's just having a test down at around a strategically technical point of interest which is around this s1 in the futures which was then the overnight asia pack high the reopening uh, gap down that we had don't forget as well um, that in europe as i'll discuss in a moment the covid case situation continues to worsen that is resulting in rollers of, of lockdown in the likes of germany most likely ireland we've also already seen that in france and italy last week and that economically is also going to have further impacts particularly as well compounded by the fact that if this vaccine confrontation between the eu and the uk continues then all the more pressure it's like to put on the eu in particular given their current status with the state of rollout at the moment with the vaccine so keeping an eye here this lower bound level that was support area back on the 10th uh, of the month and we had a retest of that on friday session and in the overnight session which was the s1 just below there any break of that be looking down to the next areas to the lows that we had on the morning of the 9th would be quite a bit further down at 118.77 and a half there in the euro uh, pair. Uh, otherwise then a bit of Dixie strength is resulting in a bit of downside pressure in the um, commodity space. Gold uh, just reversing course from some of the elevated moves seen towards the end of last week. So down 12 bucks having broken through the um, low that we had in the overnight Asia pack session to trade down to the lows from um, overnight Thursday going into Friday of last week, which was around 1727. Just seeing a bit of res uh, response and support there on that initial dip as Europe have come in. Uh, and then elsewhere in the equity markets, um, we were initially positive uh, a little bit in the overnight Asia pack session for US futures. However, we have paired a little bit in the NASDAQ just running into some shorter term um, resistance here around the R1 and you can see here from last Wednesday's low and the breakdown of that price we saw late on Thursday uh, coming up on the retest just just fading a little bit here uh, as we get underway in the European session. DAX already down about 65 and also worth just keeping an eye on the retest down uh, at Friday's low which again was the overnight low uh, in the futures market. Um, that kind of mild moderate risk off tone being observed then and supporting fixed income futures which if, if anything comes a little bit of a relief from the pressured uh, price that we had with yields rising towards the end of last week so the US 10 years just coming up to strategically an area of interesting resistance here uh, this again dates back to going back to the fifth of the month which was a key area of support for price before the eventual breakdown that we had kind of middle latter of last week post fed after initial knee jerk kind of dovish relief uh, than the ensuing move that happened thereafter. And so pretty decent bounce here in yields at the moment um, with, as I said, some of the general uh, soft risk off tone being observed this morning. 
All right, well, look, let's get into the headlines. Let's talk about a couple, a couple of different stories. And I'm going to kick things off looking at this. So the European Union will review all requests to export AstraZeneca's vaccine to the UK very severely and will probably reject them until the drug maker fulfills its delivery obligations um, according to the to, to the block according to a senior EU official um, so this is kind of the next evolution of what we thought was um, a fail a fairly kind of taming of the the breakout that was happening between these two nations over this subject matter uh, given the fact that the EMA came out last week and basically said the, the benefits outweighed the risks and that brought a lot of European major nations back to the table to start using the Astra drug. But it's almost flipped again in a more negative fashion where, with this latest headline that the EU set to block exports of Astra vaccine and ingredients to the UK. Now, there's a few things to be aware of here. Um, separately over the weekend, Pfizer has urged the EU to back down from its threat to block vaccine exports to the UK. And this is a very important point because it claims Britain could hit back by impounding crucial UK manufactured ingredients for vaccines produced in Europe. Remember, it's not all done in kind of one closed manufacturing facility. They need to acquire in the supply chain lots of different ingredients in order to make these vaccines. And even for the European manufactured vaccines like Pfizer, uh, in the likes of Belgium and so on, a lot of the ingredients come from the UK. Um, there is some coverage of a company called Crowder International, in case you hear of that name, that's a Yorkshire-based company in the UK uh, who supply uh, basically lipid nanoparticles to Pfizer in Europe. Um, so the kind of read-through of this and something that one of our guys was talking about over the weekend in the Amplify Live chat was that if von der Leyen was to enforce enforce an export ban on Pfizer vaccines from Belgium, for example, uh, a simple retaliatory measure would be for the UK government to ban the export of those um, particular ingredients. And the consequence of that would be a swift halt to vaccine production for Pfizer in that facility in Belgium. So it's almost like self, self-inflicting self in a certain way if you really want to push the button and go a little bit more nuclear on this, this particular confrontation. Uh, there is a European Council meeting taking place at the end of this week, so it'd be interesting to see where we stand at the moment. And the reason for that is that, just to update you, the EU COVID situation is getting worse at the moment. Uh, Germany is considering an extension of its lockdown restrictions um, into April uh, and the introduction of new rules for those returning from abroad. So I'm losing track now of the amount of times that that German lockdown has, has been rolled over. It's been certainly multiple. That follows the tightening of several key restrictions on the lockdown, the likes of France and Paris, uh, and also across different regions in Italy last week. And Ireland reported the most cases um, in nearly a month over the weekend. And that's threatening uh, government plans to loosen some of the restrictions there locally as well. Uh, meanwhile, in the UK, very different story for the time being, at least. Uh, we obviously know that um, given the supply issue that's coming from an Astra facility uh, based out in India, that is going to impact the rate of which vac- that vaccinations can be administered in the month of April. But for the moment, it's all going at rapid pace. And more than 27.6 million people in Britain now, well over half of the adult population, have now received at least their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, according to official data yesterday, Sunday. Uh, it was a daily record, actually. This this actual chart doesn't quite encapsulate, in fact, the, the last print, which is even higher here. Um, up to 844,285 doses were administered um, over the weekend on, on Sunday. Um, although the government, as I said, has warned that it will slow down next month due to a supply crunch. Um, meanwhile, in the US, one thing that was also uh, has, has cropped up is an interesting comment out of the former FDA commissioner uh, here talking about basically a variant B1526, a variant that's been identified of coronavirus in New York. Uh, and basically what, what's being said here is that what they don't understand this new variant is whether or not people are being reinfected with uh, the virus or whether or not people who might have been vaccinated are now getting infected with it. Um, So is it the immunity is not enough or is it you've had the vaccine, but that's not enough either. Um, 
So a couple of things here to, to watch. One is that the total number of tests remains low. So that does potentially skew the results towards more um, symptomatic people being tested um, is one thing to be aware of. But I do think this is potentially something to, to watch because there is some strains of the South African virus uh, that has done a similar thing where it kind of waters down the, the effect then of the vaccines in terms of the efficacy rates. And if that were the case, obviously, this could be you know, slightly disconcerting if it was to spread beyond then the New York area more nationwide for the reopening program that the US have uh, generally going forward. Uh, particularly, I'd say over recent weeks, even months, uh, the, the COVID cases have been declining so rapidly in the likes of the US, thankfully, in cases and thus hospitalizations and deaths that there's been a lot of uh, kind of a movement away from tracking of these types of numbers so closely. But if this situation did turn out to be something more aggressive that could spread, that could um, you know, render that uh, the, the fact that immunity in itself is not enough or even the vaccine, then certainly we're right back in the thick of it again. Uh, and so that's something that markets certainly have not priced in at this point in time. So I'm talking there's a few things, a few dominoes need to fall before we get to that point, certainly. Uh, but something I'd be watching for uh, as we go throughout the week for more information on that matter. Okay, the other thing I wanted to mention was, just because you're probably reading a lot about it, is the Turkish lira got absolutely hammered in the reopening of trade. Uh, and the reason for that is because it basically reversed all of the gain that was seen under the former central bank uh, leaders, uh, Agbal uh, performance. Um, Agbal had come in, I believe he was the third central bank chief in, in Turkey in less than two years, but had restored some degree of calm reflected then in the appreciation generally of Turkish assets adopting a more kind of uniform global approach to central banking and foreign investors were liking that. Uh, but we basically reversed all of the gains then since he came in and we, we dropped as much as 17% overnight. Um, so the person coming in, I'm not even going to attempt to say the name, <laughs> but you can check out the notes uh, on, my, on my Twitter uh, post that I do every morning. But he's a little known professor of banking and a former lawmaker from the ruling Justice and Development Party. And importantly, whenever any new policymaker comes in, well, what's their kind of stance on the economy and future monetary policy? So in a recent column, um, that person wrote uh, basically that interest rate increases will indirectly lead to an increase in inflation. Uh, that is definitely counterintuitive to most modern macroeconomic theory. Uh, but it is aligned, of course, with Erdogan. Uh, and uh, who is a vocal opponent of high rates. So there's a lot of politics as ever involved uh, with Turkey and it looks like we're going to go through the latest kind of episode of volatility here now that, as I said, this is the third central bank chief to get the chop in, in less than two years. So yeah, definitely something there moving the local asset a lot um, to be aware of. Otherwise, looking at the calendar for the week ahead, a um, few things to be aware of. Today, actually, is one thing that's not actually mentioned here on this calendar, which is you do get the ECB's Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, the PEP update. And if you remember, this is from the meeting when Christine Lagarde was talking about we're going to significantly increase the pace of, the, of our bond buying, but it wasn't really going to kick in if they were, in fact, doing that and to what degree until the data we're going to see later on today. So it could be definitely quite interesting. Um, analysts at ING note an increase in net weekly buying to above 20 billion, so this is your kind of reference point, would be seen as sizable and could provide some support to European debt markets and perhaps even slow the rise in US yields. So definitely keeping an ear out for 20 billion above or below uh, is indicative then uh, of that move. Otherwise, today, yeah, you do have uh, Fed Chair Powell takes part in the BIS panel and central bank on, on central bank innovation. There's a lot of other actual um, central bank speakers coming throughout the day, so <coughs> something to just be aware of. Otherwise, going over to UK, uh, UK, you get the jobs data on Tuesday morning. But just quickly to show you and stick with the UK, you've got UK CPI on Wednesday morning, so these numbers at 7 o'clock, and then on Friday, you get UK retail sales as well. 
So jobs data, Tuesday, CPI, Wednesday, UK retail sales on Friday. I would say overall, these would normally be tier one market movers, but um, just given the context of having already seen the Bank of England uh, meeting just a few days ago last week, and also the fact that they're in a holding pattern really now for the foreseeable future, um, I don't really think that this data has the propensity to really move the needle a great deal. Uh, so something to be aware of if you are a sterling trader, but I don't really think it's going to be the be all and end all uh, this week. I'm still looking for dollar um, fluctuation movement to be the real guideline for a lot of these uh, major currency pairs. Um, otherwise, Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, Tuesday the first day where Powell and the newly appointed Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen will appear before the House panel on the CARES Act. Um, they're going to repeat that on Wednesday, I believe, and this is uh, kind of a joint session where they're going to be questioned on things like the response to the pandemic, including the US stimulus package as well that's just been uh, unveiled of that 1.9 trillion. Uh, otherwise, again, littered with lots of central bank speak, um, as you can see here from the Bank of England's Haldane, Cunliffe, all the way through to Bostick, Brennard, Williams, uh, Bullard, all talking on Tuesday as well. Now, moving further forward, Wednesday's uh, a very important day as far as the calendar is concerned. That's when we get the flash PMI service manufacturing numbers for March. Uh, so we get the UK, well, Europe, the UK in the morning and followed by the US in, in the afternoon as well. Uh, so definitely that will be quite key. And it may well reflect the contrast at the moment that we're seeing between chiefly the COVID underlying situation and the vaccination rollout causing a um, divergence between then the state perhaps of these PMIs where UK and US are more positive than that of mainland Europe for the time being. Um, going further forward to Thursday, you've got Bank of England Governor Bailey speaking, the Central Bank Innovations, so a similar kind of event to that of Powell speaking today. Uh, more CB speakers throughout that day. Then you've got the Q4, I think it's the final reading of GDP for the US. And then on Friday, um, German IFO, and personal spending, which would be quite interesting to look at if it does encapsulate any of those stimulus checks, uh, which perhaps might not show up until the following month's data. Uh, but that, that's pretty much it. And then you've got the European Council meeting as well on Thursday and Friday, as mentioned here at the top. Um, so don't forget the US clocks um, are, are still ahead of us. The UK clocks, I don't believe, change until this weekend. So all of the market hours, if you're based in London, are going to be still an hour earlier for US opens. So uh, the open on Wall Street at 1.30, major US data typically at 12.30, so on and so forth. So just remember that as well. Otherwise, that is it. I'm going to let you guys get on with it. Uh, any questions at all, just feel free to, to leave a comment on this video. Absolutely happy to uh, get back to you and help if I can. Uh, otherwise, for the Amplify Live community, I'll see you on the Discord room. Thanks very much. Have a good week.